So many of you have come quite a long way, and even if you just come up the road, you're giving up two days of your life to actually consider these policy issues. I think that's a big investment, and I think we need to use that investment wisely, and we need to use it well. So in my view, something productive comes out of the next 48 hours, or else I'll certainly get a plane back to London disappointed. So we need to achieve something, and the starting point for all of this for me is homelessness is a global issue that demands our attention now. Homelessness is not a hopeless or helpless and insolvable problem. And if we just start with that, from that we can build success and different things. We are surrounded by people that think homelessness and poverty will always be with us that this is their fault and the system will never be good enough to reach these people out of poverty and homelessness. No one in this room, if they want to solve homelessness, can have that as any part of their psyche or their being. Homelessness is not hopeless. These people are not helpless. And it is our job to make sure that we stand up on their behalf in order to actually take the action required to bring an end to homelessness, not just to alleviate it or reduce it, but are words that frankly I'm sick of hearing and I don't want to die on this earth knowing that all we have done is shift a problem, write a better research report, produce another bloody strategy that may nowadays be on YouTube, but actually the human beings are still dying out there on our streets and we knew what we could do about it and we weren't prepared to take the challenging and difficult steps to ourselves in order to bring an end to that homelessness. That, for me, is what the Institute on Global Homelessness is all about. That is my starting point, it is my ending point, and it is why I will always be, I believe the American expression is, a pain in the ass. <laughs> Did I get that right, Karen? Thank you very much. Good job, good job. You see, we just can't say it in the way you say it. I just feel terribly awkward saying good job. I want to say, yeah, it wasn't too bad, but you know, next time you can try a little bit better, Jeremy. I'd be awfully grateful. Not good job. Yeah, I just can't do it. I'm not going to go there. I, 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 can't, I can't do it. Too awkward. So, um, solving homelessness, you see, is as much about that determination and that belief but anything else, anything else that we learn, we share, or we understand in these next 48 hours has to start on this bedrock of determination and belief. That's the starting point for this conference, and that's what you have to have in your hearts as you return to your organisations in the next two days. Solving it means finding renewed vigour and determination. It means challenging ourselves, our systems, and indeed our own values as, as, as important as anything else that we may do, whatever methodology, whichever research, however this is strategized, and the longest word I've ever seen in years, I think it was, what was that word, observationalist or something? It was just incredibly long, Walter, I've never seen anything like it. And I thought, well, clearly I didn't go to the same university as that lot, but you know, I'm hanging on in there. Of course we're here today to talk about methods, evaluation and research, but let me be clear, these things are a means to an end. They are not an end in themselves. Make that mistake and you will be here in 10 years. And I won't be with you because I'll be out there doing something more productive where you're still scratching your heads about what to include in a definition. That, folks, another American expression, I've been here for 24 hours, would be a major mistake. Solving homelessness is about determination. Research and strategy are the powerful weapons that we need. We need research. We need simplicity that policymakers can understand. So sometimes, please don't make it too bloody complicated, because certainly I don't get through uh, much beyond a summary, and I certainly won't be reading the vast majority of it. And that's the vast majority of people in governments and funders, remember. So, good to know it's there in the appendices. Is that that, or is that the thing at the back of the document? I can't remember. I can't remember, that's gone. But anyway, in, in, the, in the annex at the back of the document, fine. But we need something simple that people can eat, believe, and make change on the back of it. That's when research is powerful. That's when strategy isn't powerful. That's when, as Steve says, 
What's the expression you used just before I came up here? Make research matter. Make research matter. That's what we're in the business of in this institute. I'm not interested in research for research's sake. I'm interested in eradicating homelessness, and I need research that nobody can disagree with. So it also means, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, to say really that, that the important thing for all of us, surely, is, we, is, we, is we're here in Chicago, is that it is homeless people that have given us the mandate to be here. It is they have given us the mandate to be here for 48 hours. It is upon their behalf that we have to make research matter and that it is a means to an end, not an end in itself. I personally think that we need research that is so rigorous and so straightforward that people cannot ignore it. Because behind all of this are some tricks about how you get people to listen to you, whether that's you know, surrounding the Taj Mahal in India, or whether that's in Parliament Square in London. There are tricks of the trade that get you listened to, that gets changed, that I'll come to, in my view. And I think we need to create today, and as we go forward, a nation of believers that know we can tackle this problem. If anybody's sitting here thinking this is just too difficult, we're in the wrong place. This is the wrong conference. Have a nice lunch and you know go. Because actually we have to stand together on this. Sorry to be so tough. I was told the speech was tough. I did, I'm making it tougher actually. Can I <laughs> apologise. I've actually just sent half the audience home. But anyway, there we are. There's probably nice bars around the place. You go, that bloody woman from London. Who the hell do you think she is? Coming in here telling us what to do. Well, I've come in here and I'm telling you what to do. And I'll get away with it for a bit longer. Come on, you even laughed at that. You're being quite nice to me. I've been so bloody horrible to you lot. And yet you're still being nice to me. This is incredibly kind of all of you. I'm actually quite nice underneath it all, I promise. I don't look nice, I know that. But, you know, I'm quite nice underneath it all. Come on, I can make that joke. It's post-feminism, I've decided, in the new world. That's why I call that. I wonder how that translates. But anyway, there we are. We need a nation of believers that know we can tackle this problem. And we need that nation of believers to start here in this room in Chicago today. We can't do this on our own. We can't do it without you. We can't do it without the diversity of thought, without the type of people coming across the world. You can help each other as much as you can help us help each other too. That's going to be so powerful. But at the core, my message is we have to have hope and that we are not helpless to change. One person's voice is always important, but if we stand together, an organized crowd of voices with a shared belief across borders, across countries, across continents, then anything can happen and we should be unstoppable. And homeless people, whether it's in India, London, or Chile, or Greece, or anywhere else, or North Korea, they deserve an unstoppable force that is unrelenting in our determination to make sure that governments, policy makers, and funders do not stand by for another bloody decade, another month, another week, another night for some of these human beings is simply too long. We have to have a greater sense of urgency, and we need to balance that out with the need for research and evaluation and strategy. Always a tension, always a healthy tension, but one that has to exist within the same room. I, of course, don't do these ludicrous jobs unless I believe that anything is possible. That just comes with the territory. I honestly think human beings are our biggest asset. They are the most extraordinary gift that the world has. Anything is possible as long as human beings breathe air, they can make changes in their own lives as much as in each other's. And when we, in this room, frankly have the privilege, because that's what it is, to stand up for people who are poor, to stand up for people who are homeless, people who are powerless, then it is, in my view, our responsibility to believe that anything is possible and that we should stand together to take action. This conference, the baby organisation, which is this institute, together all of us in this room must take action these next two days to get the kind of, I believe they're called nowadays, not-for-profit organisations, otherwise known as charities at home, um, 
leaders, government, policy makers and academics, we need to pull everybody to be going in the right direction. And that's going to be where research can help us bind together and if we get it right, that will be one of the tools that helps bind that conversation with these disparate different people that may not want to come on that same journey. Slowly and surely change will come, but I say to you today, it cannot come soon enough so many families and so many individuals that we do need to hang on to that sense of urgency. Now, I was asked to talk a little bit about some stuff that we did uh, back in the UK, and I, I wanted to be absolutely clear from the outset that we are a very, very small country with a population of around 60 million, 65, higher nowadays. Is it really? Well, that's anyway, UK. that's the UK. Which? We've locked off Scotland yeah, recently, yeah. though. Scotland Scotland. Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 that I, not that I'm bitter and upset about that at all. You know, I've really gone over the whole Scotland thing. But anyway, there we are. <laughs> you know, I like Scotland as well, but you know. Um, <laughs> yes, you see, it's always a matter of a little bit of humour that probably is a nightmare for somebody who's doing the translation. I really apologise. I'll use the Jeremy line, it's irony. Okay, there we are. <laughs> 15 all, Jeremy. There you go. Um, uh, we're a small country, and if truth be told, I don't know how this translates, we have a lot of views, as you can probably see. And, you know, I don't know how you say this, but we can be a bit full of ourselves, I suppose. So I, uh, uh, I'm always careful to say, look, we did some stuff. We've got a particular country, a particular way of operating. Some of it was good, some of it wasn't so good. I want you to, um, you know, take what is right for you take what is right for your own country, take what is right for your own character, and then kind of see what I'm talking about in that, in that frame, really. I'm not standing here today saying, hey, we in London's great, because it wasn't, and it won't replicate everywhere in the same sort of way. 1997, though, was a huge year in the United Kingdom. The Blair government arrived with a mandate to tackle what we called at that point social exclusion, and part of the homelessness drive fell out of that. To be honest, by the time we got to 97, I would say homelessness had become an issue for so many people in the country because it was a symbol of our selfishness. It was a symbol of how our society in the UK had lost a sense of what caring for each other was actually about. We'd lost our way. There were stories about ministers stepping over people as they left the opera uh, and, and kind of walking. It, it just, it, it was of its moment. It was our way of saying that the selfishness and the kind of way that we've been operating over the country, it was our symbol of what we wanted to change. And I think what's therefore interesting about it is as appointed then as the homelessness are, with the full backing actually of charities that I'd worked with for so many years before, extra funding from government, great, lovely, lovely, and support across the prison provide, you would think that it would have been plain sailing to be the homelessness are. And though we do deem that period as successful, and uh, we did help thousands of people uh, no longer come, become homeless and get help and all sorts of things, I did think it's interesting just to reflect on how unbelievably tough that time was. <coughs> That's the only way of describing it, and I think it's probably worth me talking about that just for a moment or two. Many had trodden the path before of trying to tackle homelessness, street homelessness, rough sleeping, whatever expression we use, depending which government's in power and how they want to talk about it. Um, we had tried to tackle rough sleeping and homelessness before. And I think um, the government had, at that point, left it to some charities to define it, to solve it, and indeed to decide how the money was spent. And actually what we did was process was paramount. We were obsessed with processes, counting processes. We were obsessed with the measurement of process. And again, a cautionary note as we think about what we're doing here, process fails homeless people. It doesn't get them off the street. It doesn't get them work. It doesn't get them housed. Counting the number of times you've had a chat with a homeless person to persuade a funder that you're worth your salary true story, that's one of the things I had to do, uh, doesn't actually house a homeless person, doesn't actually get them off the street, doesn't actually get you any change. And that's what we did. We, we, we counted the number of contacts, how many times you chatted to a homeless person. 
whether they were healthy or whether they were happy or whether they were housed wasn't relevant. We funded services, we funded contacts, we funded chats. We didn't fund whether anything had changed. And that was one of the fundamental shifts. We didn't have a clear definition or goal. I arrived at Shelter, which is where uh, Chris, Chris was, and the beginning of Shelter, run by the very formidable Sheila McKechnie, actually, I remember arriving and I just got a dream of a job. I mean, I just was made up. I was knee-high to a grasshopper. What is that in a normal language? How do you explain? I was young. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably, you know, hopeless. So uh, that's that one done. I've never managed that one. It's great a bit of O-level Spanish together. Um, I was very young, I was very excited, and I was actually quieter than I am now. And I sat in this meeting one day, this policy and research meeting. Everybody's very excited. We come up with a new figure, a new figure. And we had sheets. Uh, again, there were bits of paper and campaigning in those days. I'm very old, I just look very young. And, oh come on, that's quite funny as well. <laughs> Nobody laughed at all at that one. Um, and, you know, we had pink sheets, we had blue sheets, we had green sheets, handing them out to people campaigning. And he said, two million people homeless in the UK. And I kind of worked in hostels, I'd worked on the streets, I, I you know, worked in day centres. I was thinking, that's an awfully big number, if you don't mind me saying. Two million people, what's that all about? You know, population, it was a lot less that, but it would have been 50, 60 yeah, million. Yeah. I think two million people homeless. So eventually I thought, I'll just, you know, that's up. Hi, uh, every policy research campaigning clever person. Where does that two million figure come from? And then, oh, Louise, we just, it's so cool, there's students. I went, students, you are having a bloody laugh, aren't you? So the vast majority of this two million weren't what I would consider homeless at all. They were students. They were privileged people going to universities and colleges. Am I supposed to bother about them because they're sharing a, you know, a house with a rat downstairs for three years before they become my boss? No. 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 Eaton, Oxbridge, Cambridge people. I am not bothered about your bloody rat in your house in multiple occupation for three years before I'm actually working for you. You can stuff your two million figure. At a jot, I thought, oh my God, how do these utterly fantastic people, fantastic people run this organisation? passionate about solving homelessness, over-egged it, inflated it, went too wide, had absolutely no credibility whatsoever. None. Out the door. Done. So, I can't remember why that rant was in the speech. It just says here, shelter story, and I'm not quite sure why I was using it, but I always, I always uh, get a laugh, which is very nice of you. But, um, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that by so doing, the national organisation on homelessness in the UK lost credibility and didn't have focus. That's a very dangerous place for any organisation to be <coughs> when its mandate comes from homeless people. Because that's the point that grounds us all. Our mandate is our cause. We're not a cause on our own. We don't run these <coughs> organisations because we like doing it. We do it because people need us to do it. Right from the beginning of the Rough Sleepers Drive, we, <coughs> the key charities, note the word key, wasn't every charity, it was key charities, the government and campaigners, we agreed our focus, and rudimentary, as it was, I'm not even looking at Suzanne as I say this, rudimentary, as the rough sleeping count was, it got legs, and we got it done throughout <coughs> many, many cities in the UK, and we did the same approach on the same night, small step, taken by everybody, netted as a result that no politician could, uh, could, could, could disagree with. So one of the biggest lessons for me, the hardest to learn, the most difficult to enact, was never ever to accept failure, to accept inaction or believe that we would fail. We relentlessly focused on the most vulnerable, the most challenging, and those that have been on the streets for years. This is tough territory. <coughs> those that no one, except people like Jeremy Swain, thought would come in. We didn't help everybody, we didn't reach out to everybody, we targeted the programme on those that we judged together had been out the longest, had the biggest needs and were the most vulnerable. And then we humanised it. I've been struck over the years really by how in all of this talk of policy and strategy and research and everything else, we, I, often lose sight of what really, really matters. <coughs> And uh, everything we do, really, is about that human interaction, about that common care for each other. 
We would be better off, I, I'm going to get this off my chest now, we would be better off having 10 countries walk out here tomorrow night, hopefully across all of the continents, that does one small measurement step at the same time this year, not 10 years from now, but this year, that we publish and say, isn't it interesting how Chicago compares with India, that compares with Australia, that compares with this. That starts to get interesting. One small step, one type of measurement, street homelessness. And the other thing I was thinking about as I was listening to this is, you don't need to do everywhere. Pick the square mile or kilometer, whatever it is, under the noses of the politicians and journalists. Count them there and then humanize who those human beings are. Tell their stories. Tell the stories as to why they're on the streets. Then you start to get change. We are more powerful if we do 10 of those in the next six months or 12 months than we are if we sit here for another 10 years having a thing. Honest to God, the research is a means to an end for a campaign to create change. That's what, that's what it's all about. So, by reaching out on the terms of the people that we felt had been left behind before, we changed the culture. I can remember to this day when John, who sat between the same uh, two, door, two windows of the Army and Navy in Victoria Street that your Sue Summers targeted and targeted and targeted. I remember the night John came in. I remember the night that we had four people that said they'd only come in on St. Patrick's Day. We were there on St. Patrick's Day and they came in. I remember my 80-year-old woman covered in sores at the back street where there was no provision in London at that stage. She was 80-odd years of age and she was incoherent and we took her to St. Mungo's sick bay in a male hostel, much to everybody being outraged that we dared to take a woman into a male hostel, but we broke every rule that we could really, didn't we, Jeremy, just to make a point that actually we weren't going to take no for an answer. And it meant I had to sit in a room with her all night in a sick bay in a hostel, that's what we would bloody well do, because we were not going to leave an 80-year-old woman with sores out on the street all night. All of those people will stay in my mind and in my heart for as long as I breathe. Because it, 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 at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, isn't it? That's what this is all about. That's what every single bit of research is all about. It's enabling us to help the eight-year-olds, help the four lads of only coming on St. Patrick's Day, to reach out to John, the iconic figure that nobody ever thought would come in. When he came in, jaws dropped all over London thinking, Blind me, okay, and that was his organisation that got that human being in, not me, Jeremy's organisation. So, we weren't just interested in numbers, yes we had a target to meet, I like targets, I like focusing uh, the mind on doing things in a particular way, but who we got in mattered as much. Street counts are a powerful tool, whichever method <coughs> people use, but let's just choose the same method so we can compare them. But anyway, more of that. Because they named the problem, <coughs> they made it manageable, and they helped change the culture. We have bosses out at 2 a.m. in the morning doing street counts. Nothing focuses politicians, leaders, managers' minds like the smell of gangrene in Lincoln's Inn Field at 2 o'clock in the morning. Maybe tomorrow morning when they go back into work, they might think slightly differently about homelessness. We were relentless. We took politicians out, we took journalists out, we took uh, funders out. We would take anybody onto the street and get them to experience what sleeping on the street in our country, which is frankly, you know, possibly better in terms of climate than some of the countries represented in the room here today, in terms of just the physical sleeping out, and it, it changed the way people think. Together we decided to focus on the most vulnerable, that meant tough and uncomfortable choices, that meant leaving some people on the streets whilst others came in. Yes. Yes, imagine trying to manage that uh, in organisations that are full of kids that think everybody should get help and everybody's equal, I could be homeless tomorrow, all of those messages which just don't pan out. Tough ask of the workers, but as we got the most vulnerable in, then actually the workers came on board. We had to challenge ourselves and the system. It means, it was entertaining really at the moment, you know, asking psychiatrists, <gasps> to leave their hospitals and consulting rooms. <gasps> what, the white coats are going onto the street? You mean you've got them out, Louise? Mm. 
and they might actually have to talk to somebody on the street rather than in their nice little environment that's significantly more comfortable. That was like, I can't tell you the negotiations involved with getting that one done. <coughs> Remarkable, we were fully funding some of these people and they still thought they should just sit in the hospital all day and wait for us to pop in. It was just incredible. They thought they were doing us a favour. If they ran a little surgery in a day centre for a couple of hours a week, they thought that was really the bee's knees. Had they lost their minds? It was a bit like, not Jeremy's organisation, but others thought that they would do outreach between nine and five. Ah, oh, right, okay. Well, most homeless people are out overnight. And actually, it would be great if you could get people in hostels at night. It would be great if you could do assessments at night. I would be so grateful if the two major London day centres run by two different religions, imagine that one, Church of England and Catholics, ran to the most... They both closed every summer for the same six bloody weeks. Well, imagine trying to tell them that the show's over on that front. I can assure you, this, so I'm making it sound funny, but it's not funny because the system's geared around itself. The reason it works from nine to five is because then you can have a social life, can't you? Particularly when you're 27 and you want to be out all the time. No, give me a 50-year-old has-been worker like me to tramp around the streets at nine, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and then hassle the living daylights out of the hostels to say it's not acceptable, you can't do an assessment now. That's what this takes. That's what this is all about. One of our most popular moves, I wrote mine, I'm going to say ours, so I can not take it, was to criticise soup runs and handing out money to beggars. We got to a point where the handout culture was actually keeping people where they were. You know, at one moment, I had to do this audit on one of the jobs that the likes of Jeremy made me do, I did an audit of Lincoln's in Fields, and actually on a Tuesday night between 8 and 9 o'clock, there were seven soup runs that all descended on the poor people that were there. And they just dumped all their bloody soup, their muck, their this and that and the other, there were rats <coughs> everywhere. Well, I swear to God, I, I, I was the devil when I had to go along to these meetings of soup runs and say, OK, if you really must hand out soup, can you not all go at the same time? Can you at least have a little bit of a rotor, perhaps, every month? <gasps> it's an outrage. It's the government cracking down on soup runs. <laughs> it's an outrage. It was just extraordinary changing the culture around the homeless <coughs> people was frankly more difficult than just getting the offer right to the person on the street. That's where this heads. This is the difficult territory that's called solving homelessness. And uh, of course, we can reflect on the Rough Sleepers Unit as a successful time and a positive time, but I would say it was an incredibly tough and difficult period and that we stand together at the end of it, as you can see, with strong relationships. But boy, oh boy, it was a tough thing to do and continues to be a tough thing to do. Some personal advice then for those of you, if you're looking for some popularity contest, you won't win one if you leave Chicago tomorrow deciding you're going to end salt homelessness. It doesn't make you popular challenging people. On, even if you're doing it on behalf of homeless people, the status quo is always the way that people <coughs> want it to be. And if you're in the business of change, if we're in the business of using research to eradicate homelessness rather than move it around the edges, then this isn't about popularity, it's about doing the right thing. Um, wh where does this leave us? I worry, hard lessons, once a strategy is done, there's been a nice consultation, there's been an agreement, there's this huge feel-good factor breaks out. <gasps> didn't we do a good job, put a really interesting piece of work together, launched it, not with a glass of wine anymore, but you know, probably herbal tea nowadays. Um, oh come on, I'm from London, you know, you know our national reputation, I'm just reinforcing it. Um, I don't know how that translates either, but anyway, there we are. And, and because actually they think that's an end in itself, the same way uh, people will start to say as time goes on, I know we made uh, that strategy, we put that agreement together, but you know, I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure we quite got the definition right. I think we need to move the goalposts. Let's do a review. That's a really clever thing to get out of doing anything, is doing a review. The amount of times I hear that in Whitehall in London is, is remarkable. Um, we need to be bigger, better, different, broader, rounder, softer, up, down, anything really that puts off putting action <coughs> on the table. Even if 50% of the action is right, 50% is wrong, I'll take the 50% rather than do nothing.
I mean, seriously, that, that, these people die out there, you know. I'd rather, they would probably rather be taken 50%. The temptation to be the most popular person on earth is very powerful. No better way to spread the feel-good factor by have everybody in the room. If there is any money, let's apportion it to everybody. Let's take £5,000 and split it 50,000 ways. And then everybody will be happy because they've got a piece of the pie. No change for homeless people, though, is there? So that involves a difficult conversation, and that involves different types of compromise and collaboration between agencies, which people aren't that comfortable with. Change is hard. It's not about cutting ribbons on the latest project, or landing some funding, or a great bit of publicity. Eradicating homelessness is about focusing on those who need the most help, being frankly judgmental about that, and getting people off the streets permanently and to a better life. So ask yourself as public servants as you gather here in Chicago, why did I come into this? Try to leave aside your organisation. We're always tempted to say my organisation is better than your organisation. It's kind of human, but it won't help us as we go forward. Leave aside the fundraising. We deserve the money better, we can spend it better than them. Try and put that to one side. That's another really <coughs> difficult thing to do in such a competitive environment. We don't have to be there. Leave aside the feel-good factor of you know, growing the size of your organisation, the number of beds, the number of staff, the number of contacts, frankly the number of fridges used, the number of meals handed out. We're great and people need us. Do they need what you're offering or do they need something different to solve their problem? The temptation just to grow and say that's a good thing isn't necessarily right. And I say that as somebody that works for a government that never lets me close anything down that I've run. It's one of the biggest negotiations with them, is once I've done something, they just want it to go on and on and on and on and on, as if that's a good thing in itself, and it's not. So I, 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 you know, I, I think that, I think these are the things which we will need to work our way through depending where you are and what you're doing. And I think for me, I said it earlier really, the way to deal with those difficult things is to remember the first person you helped, the person that most sticks in your mind, my 80-year-old lady, the 16-year-old care leaver on the Strand, John on Victoria Street, to remember those people. And it gets you through the fact you're not that popular anymore, the partnership meeting doesn't feel quite so comfortable, and the funders are thinking, why is this person being so difficult? We actually quite like just handing about a bit of money on soup. Um, it gets you through those things. I think we need to remember the person. I think we need to remember our humanity as we start down this path. We need to remember our mission transcends any organisation. And I think we need to do that in the next 48 hours. Mark alluded to the fact I currently um, run a programme for vulnerable families in the UK and we're focusing on taking action on those 120,000 families. And just a quick reflection on that. At its heart, it is up against exactly the same issues that we wrestled with in homelessness and continue to do. Families that are homeless, families whose experience of violence is not deemed traumatic but normal, families whose children, they end up lost and alone and sometimes, as I saw in Rotherham, preyed upon. These families, when you listen to them and you talk to them, they talk about a history of physical violence and sexual abuse, often going back generations. The involvement of the welfare system in these children's lives and their family lives is endemic. It's just part of what they think is normal. So often being removed from the home into the state of the care and then returned. These children, frankly, becoming parents as teenagers and unable to deal with them. Parents often in violent relationships. Children growing up to then be labelled as having behavioural problems, leading to exclusion from school, antisocial behaviour and crime. The weight of that intergenerational dysfunction has presented itself into problems, problems that we then have built services around, which is what's so interesting and so the parallel into homelessness. Each bit of the system has come at the problem through its own lens. These families are the living embodiment of how the system treats those symptoms. So of course we need to help the families, we need to turn around these families, but we need to turn around the troubled services too. And that's the big cultural gain, and that's the thing that we need to think cleverly about. I think that um, when you see an intractable problem, it indicates a need for radical change. And change involves disruption. It involves disruption. Spending money is easy. Setting up a new service is easy in some countries, not everywhere. But changing the status quo is very difficult. At its easiest, when I look back on 
the last 20 or 30 years, we've demolished buildings in our country and we've rebuilt them. We've landscaped, done the gardens, we've renewed the lighting, we've put better fences up, we've got better bars on, on windows to stop men coming back to beat their women up. We're quicker at putting buttons in so they can speed dial the police. But we haven't. What we've done is we've focused on buildings and environment because it is much, much easier to do that than to focus on behaviour and culture. And at the end of the day, if you're tackling something like hopelessness, problem families, anything like that, it is about behaviour and it is about culture. This takes leadership. It's not easy. Frankly, I know it's not easy for the system. It's not easy for the workers. Frankly, it's not easy for homeless people the same way with the families, to have upwards of 14 or 15 different organisations prodding and pushing and assessing them in their lives, which is as bad as it can get. And as hard as it is to accept the truth that despite all our best efforts in our country over many years, and I include myself in that, we just didn't get this right. We didn't <coughs> succeed in getting these families to change or in stopping the intergenerational transmission of their problems. We just haven't. And as a result, we have written adults off and when we do that we condemn their children to repeating their same mistakes and growing up in exactly the same circumstances. In our country we can no longer afford to do that financially but if I'm honest and candid with you today we should never have accepted the human misery and the waste of potential in the first place because we took a cushy route rather than a difficult route. We have let children down children who have no voice of their own. All of this work, tackling homelessness, is about hope. All of this is about hope, that no family is beyond redemption and no child is left behind. I put it to you today, friends and colleagues from across the globe, that we must hold it in our hearts, this sense of a common purpose, your common belief, and a common sense of determination that we have here in this room today. It's my proud, profound belief that we are, as a community, strong at the broken places. By condemning those whose lives we have asked to be given up in the, in the fight to fight our wars and our battles, for them to end up on the streets indicates that we are broken. By allowing sick and vulnerable people to end their lives alone and on the streets, it indicates to me that we are broken. By having children whose parents neglect them and abuse them, end up on the streets is an indication for me that we are profoundly broken. You today, and in the course of your jobs tomorrow, in the days and weeks to come, you in the room have the chance to fix this. That's why the stakes are so high. That's why the Institute matters so much. That's why we're here today. But fix it now with urgency, as well as with passion. Do not take no for an answer. We must challenge ourselves to do the right thing, not the easy thing. We must cling on to humility at all times, to know that others may have the answers, and that compromise is much, is, is much part of the solution. We must have hope in our hearts, as we aspire to create change for others, people that have sent us here today, people that want our purpose to be eradicating homelessness. We must stand together for those that we serve. And then, maybe then, for those communities, for those families, for those children, we do actually stand a chance to end homelessness. To end homelessness across countries, across con continents and across the globe. A través países, continentes y el mundo. Qué incredible cosa hacer cuando estamos aquí. Gracias por escucharme hoy día. En mucha suerte con todo. We must stand together for those that we serve. What an amazing thing, though, to do whilst we are on this earth. What an extraordinary privilege. What an extraordinary time. But the gift of DePaul University, we have it in our hands to do something special and important on behalf of those families and their children. I wish you only the very best. I wish you well in any endeavor you take, either globally 
internationally <coughs> or in your own country or in your own organisation. And particularly, I thank you for your kindness in the way that you have listened to me and put up with me in this last half hour. Thank you very much. Indeed.